What do you know? We need a hit, so here I go. Started baseball's famous streak that's got us all aglow. He's just a man and not a free. Jolton Joe DiMaggio. Joe, Joe DiMaggio, we want you on our side. From coast to coast, that's all you'll hear of Joe, the one-man show. He's glorified the horse hide sphere. Jolton Joe DiMaggio. Joe, Joe, the Maggio, we want you on our side. He'll live in baseball's Hall of Fame. He got there blow by blow. Our kids will tell their kids his name. Joked and Joe, the Maggio. We dream of Joey with the light from back. Joe, Joe, the Maggio, we want you on our side. Tonight, we honor the Yankee Clipper. Jolton Joe DiMaggio. From ABC News. This is Nightline. Substituting for Ted Koppel and reporting from Washington, Forrest Sawyer. That song we were just listening to was recorded back in 1941, the year of the streak. The thunder of World War was rumbling off on the horizon, and that last summer before the storm broke was filled with a kind of giddy madness. Joe DiMaggio was doing the impossible, hitting in game after game, breaking the modern National League record, then the American League record, and finally a dusty old record someone found from way back in 1897. And when the pressure grew, DiMaggio just got better. In fact, in the last 26 games of his 56-game streak, he hit an incredible 457, getting on base almost half the times he came to bat. Then the night the record run finally ended, Joe DiMaggio borrowed 16 bucks from his teammate Phil Rizzuto and went off to drink all by himself. An athlete so elegant was also a shy, isolated man who said, I'm not one of those guys who looks to be in the limelight. Instead, DiMaggio was, as one fan put it, what baseball was all about before we got to that high price stuff. Today he also seems to represent what America was all about before we got to that high price stuff. There won't be another like him. Tonight, Phil Rizzuto is with us, who played alongside DiMaggio, and Joe Garagiola, who played against him, and writer David Halberstam, who has studied the player and the man. But first, some memories with Nightline's Dave Marish. Many athletes are legends in their own time. Joe DiMaggio was a monument in his own uniform. He stood tall at the plate like the Colossus of Rhodes, feet wide apart, hardly striding at all. His swing, powerful, perfect, and predictable as the pendulum of Big Ben. The ball lands in the upper left field seat. And in the field... He glided, he didn't run. He was the first ballet dancer I ever saw. I mean, he had a grace... And he could move in such a way that that's what made him so different than anyone else. You never saw him uh, look awkward. He never had a lunging catch or dove for the ball. To the New Yorker magazine's Roger Angel, Joe DiMaggio was so smooth he became almost invisible. His manager, Joe DiMaggio, said you never saw him make a great play, which means that he was always there. He always seemed to know where the ball was going. Of course, the truth is, as the number one athlete of his time, Jolton Joe DiMaggio could hardly have been more visible especially to Italian-American kids. He was special. There was something about him. He was a winner. He was a champion. Even to a very young black athlete growing up in Alabama named Henry Aaron. Every black kid, white kid, green kid, purple, whatever color they may be, Japanese, whatever color they may be, uh, they idolized the man. You know, he was an icon. He was a ball, a fans player, you know, because he did things right. You know, he never did anything wrong. That's what was good about him. I actually saw Joe D. drop a fly ball. And on the rare occasion when DiMaggio made a mistake, Della Femina says it was instantly forgiven and always unforgettable. Well, he just glided back, put up his hand, and the ball bounced off, uh, off of his glove. And he put his head down, and the fans started to applaud him because they just applauded anything he did. And I could just see the back of his neck getting bright, bright red. Uh, he was ashamed. I mean, he just didn't do things like that. Perhaps the most amazing thing Joe DiMaggio did in 1941 was to get a base hit in 56 consecutive games. Why was that so great? 
it summarizes the two most difficult things about baseball or hitting the ball. It's the hardest single, th single thing to do in any sport. And the other is playing every day, every single day. And Joe combined two for 56 days in a row, 56 games in a row. Two years later, with World War II raging, DiMaggio volunteered for the U.S. military. He spent three seasons training Air Force cadets. You can guess what he and baseball lost by looking at his career up until then. His first seven seasons from 1936 through 1942, those seven seasons stood up against the best first seven seasons that anyone's ever had. So when Joe came back to baseball, everyone celebrated, fans and players alike. I felt like I was in heaven. You know, playing next to Joe DiMaggio, one of the greatest ball player alive. A label DiMaggio continued to earn, despite a string of injuries that took their toll, until in the World Series of 1951, the Yankee Clippers' career reached its final curtain. DiMaggio came up in the, in the eighth inning of the sixth game. It suddenly came over me, and a lot of other people who were there too at the same time, but this might be the last time I'd see him. And I could still see him stepping up with that stance and, and I, I was devouring and memorizing him. And he hit a double off the right field wall and pulled into second base standing up and looked down at his feet after that the way he always did. And, and we all said, oh, maybe that's it. Goodbye, Joe. After baseball, DiMaggio became known for his brief marriage to Marilyn Monroe and for his loyal devotion to her after their divorce. He took charge of her funeral and regularly sent flowers to her grave. If anything, his legend grew after his time. He had a great deal of charisma, and uh, he was a cut above everybody else because of that. Had a great personality, and I really think that his uh, craving for privacy uh, created an aura around him. Even when it came to selling coffee pots, he hit a grand slam. The best I've ever tasted. Joe DiMaggio was a great pitchman for one reason. When you see Joe DiMaggio's face, you know that the product is good, it had quality, he stands behind it, you are not going to be ripped off. So he, he said an awful lot of things just by showing up. Number five has passed, has passed. but he will never, never leave me. Players and fans paid tribute to DiMaggio tonight before an exhibition game in Florida. Some of the Yankees joined in honoring their hardball ancestor. Joe D just had such an elegance in it very distinguished manner about him that there's just nobody that can match him i don't think we'll ever see another one like him he'll be missed we're going to miss him opening day we missed him for the first game of the world series i know that and uh, we're going to miss him uh, come april memories of joe dimaggio scattered like all the hits in a 10-run rally across america tonight but they probably kept their flavor strongest and longest at the sons of italy senior citizens center in brooklyn where the yankees all-time center fielder is a very lively spirit. He was a great baseball player, but then I look at it that uh, it was a Italian like me, and I'm proud to have somebody play such a great game and make me feel proud to be Italian. All around ball player, you never could compare with Joe DiMaggio. Joe DiMaggio could be stubborn. He held out 12 games into the 1938 season seeking a better contract. He closed his career as baseball's first $100,000 player. And he refused to attend old-timers' days unless he was the last man introduced and unless the introduction was, quote, baseball's greatest living player. He knew what he was worth, Joe DiMaggio, and who he was, a legend for all time. I'm Dave Marish for Nightline in Washington. When we come back, three of Joe's greatest admirers, Phil Rizzuto, Joe Garagiola, and David Halberstam. This is ABC News Nightline, brought to you by Mitsubishi. Totally redesigned Mitsubishi Galant. Nicely equipped at $17,990. Oh man, it's early. Did they test through to the router? We're merging two totally different bank networks. 
Gotta work seamlessly. Seamless. AT&T says it's ready to go. <sighs> Either gonna be the hero today or... <laughs> or hiding in the john, all right? Hero. Yeah. Everyone and everything working together in a whole new way. Tomorrow, are we making meat dangerous? What we feed animals? Does it affect the way we live and put our health at risk? Watch ABC's World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Life is a journey. A drive through Main Street America. A cruise down the interstate. And around every turn, there's Chevrolet. Right now, during Chevrolet's Highway 99, you'll find APR financing as low as 0.9% or cash back up to $1,500. So don't just sit there. Hit the highway. Chevrolet's Highway 99. Going on now for a limited time at your local Chevrolet dealer. Just for feet, your New Balance headquarters would like you to meet John. John's short, thick foot with a high arch requires the New Balance 877 for the maximum in comfort and stability. Here's Susie. Average foot, average arch, above average footwear with a New Balance 852. Meet Joe. Joe's long, thin foot with a low arch makes him a perfect match for the New Balance 712. Finally, Jim takes to the trails in style in the New Balance 801. New Balance has the shoe for you right now at just four feet with a 13th pair. It's free. The Mojo comes through. A screaming two-bagger equals George Sisler's mark for hitting in 41 straight games. Yankee Hall of Fame shortstop Phil Rizzuto was Joe DiMaggio's teammate and a good friend. He joins us from St. Petersburg, Florida. From Scottsdale, Arizona, former St. Louis Cardinal Joe Garagiola played against DiMaggio. As a catcher, he got a close look at DiMaggio's skills at the plate. They came to know each other better when Garagiola went into broadcasting. Author and journalist David Halberstam's bestseller, Summer of 49, chronicles the battle for the pennant between the Boston Red Sox and DiMaggio's Yankees. And... Halberstam joins us from New York. Phil, let's start talking about uh, DiMaggio as a ball player. If memory serves, you were a rookie in 1941, and that's not a bad time to come up to the majors, especially as a Yankee. No, it certainly wasn't. It was a great year. I, I mean, I was in awe of DiMaggio all my life, and all of a sudden I'm next to him in the locker room. I, haven't, I didn't talk for about a month, I, I think. But <laughs> the thing that got me was that heroes, you know, that word is thrown around loosely, but Joe was really a hero. And... and uh, I mean, you talk about grace, he was poetry in motion. I can't imagine what the tension must have been like as this 56-game streak is just cooking along. Well, you know, the streak was a, a lot of tension until he broke Willie Keeler's record. Then after that, every game that he added to uh, was great for all of us ball players and the fans, but the press didn't uh, pick, on, pick up on it the way you would now today, where they follow hordes come around and you, you can hardly get in a press box. But how, how can it be that at, at the end of it all, after this terrible run, and his, his stomach must have been churning through some of these games, because he almost missed a few of them, and he came very close to not hitting, that he borrows 16 bucks from you and goes off by himself? <laughs> yes, he did. He, he had locked his money in a safe in the clubhouse and forgot to pick it up, and he wait, asked me to wait for him until everybody had left the stadium, fans and players, and then we see, said, okay, let's go. And we were walking up to the hotel in Cleveland, and he went into this bar on the way, and I thought I would go in with him, but he said no. And then he called me, and he had left his money in there, so he asked me for all my money I had, and I had $16 for a two-week road trip, <laughs> and I, I had to give it to him, and he never paid me back. He tried to, but I wouldn't take it. <laughs> Do you understand that, Joe? Can you understand how a man can be that private? Can I understand that? I can understand it because uh, he controlled himself. And I agree with you, though, that he must have had a hockey game going on in his stomach, <laughs> but he never let anybody know about it. Uh, uh, DiMaggio was one of those guys that was not going to give any of his body, his thoughts, his mind to anyone that he didn't want to have a piece of DiMaggio or what he believed in. Uh, uh, he was a private guy, yes, but uh, uh, he knew what was going on and very compassionate. He was a compassionate guy. Now down at St. Pete, St. Louis and the Yankees did some uh, some exhibition games and, and you were, I guess, catching him, right? 
Oh yes. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, I, I really was was uh, I, I was thrilled to hear the uh, Sons of Italy man talk about what DiMaggio meant to the Italian American because in our neighborhood where Yogi and I grew up was all Italian and and we tasted discrimination when we went out to play, for example, in the YMCA league. We'd always hear the same thing. Those Italian, but they didn't call us Italians in those days. Those Italian kids watch them; they'll steal everything. And, and anytime somebody got shot, they'd say, "Well, hey, it ends in a vowel, so it must have been them," you know, that kind of thing. But DiMaggio gave us hope. He gave the kids hope and, and to Yogi's father, my father, immigrants, they didn't know third base from the coach's box, believe me, but they knew DiMaggio. Joe DiMaggio, he meant good and, and, and that's what, what he really meant and, and when I first saw him, we, we shared the ballpark in St. Petersburg. I'm with the Cardinals after the 46 series of Red Sox and we come in there and the Yankees come walking across the field and that was the first time I saw him close up I'm telling you, I didn't know whether I should genuflect, kiss his glove, or what. I'm just looking at him like, wow, there he is, Joe DiMaggio. David, how is it that, that some people, that Muhammad Ali comes to mind, Michael Jordan comes to mind, only a very few of them, rise above their sport to become something bigger, to become uh, bigger Trans than life? Transcended its, its beauty, its grace. Uh, the great uh, Boston Globe and Esquire writer George Frazier had a phrase for it. He applied it to DiMaggio, a Spanish word, duende, a special grace. And he did that. He looked so graceful and so beautiful out there. He was actually very, very wired. I mean, the dugout, he'd be smoking cigarettes, drinking half a cup of coffee. And, I mean, and when he came up to bat uh, against a great pitcher like Feller, Charlie Keller, remember telling me, the veins stood out on the back of his neck. He pushed himself. I think he was acute aware that he was the first son of that Italian-American immigration that had made it that big, that so much was invested in him. He knew his value, he knew his worth, and the pride to be the best drove him. You, were, you mentioned off the air just a minute ago, you were, you were wondering how often he had showed emotion. 1947 World Series, David, uh, he had hit a tremendous hit. I remember that. I was there that day. And it was, it, it was caught by John Frito. John Frito turned on it caught it he was at second base he kicked the dirt later the reporters came to ask him he said he turned the wrong way he would have made it look easy if he turned the right way and actually he was right but it was a rare flash of emotion that and then when another world series when Whit Wyatt of the Dodgers threw at him he had words with him other than that he wanted he was stoic it was the Hemingway hero that kind of heroism of generation grace under pressure and you never show your anger once when uh, he was playing against the Red Sox, Joe McCarthy was managing them. Tex Houston drilled him and hit him, and McCarthy turned to the Red Sox and said, watch, he'll not show any pain. And he picked himself up, went down to first base, and never showed that the ball, in fact, hurt very much. We will talk about his reticence and his later life when we come back. Stay with us, gentlemen. You enter the financial world in search of a secure future. Instead, you find chaos and confusion. 9,000 companies to invest in. Market mania! 10,000 mutual funds to choose from. Bonds, T-bills, commodities, precious metals. With new and unfamiliar choices emerging every day. The possibilities are overwhelming. Fortunately, there is a beacon in this complex world. An experienced partner who, for half a century, has helped tens of thousands of individuals and families find comfort instead of confusion. Come to the mountain called First Union. Or, if you prefer, the mountain will come to you. Coming up. Too many labels. Just too many labels. I think the wine should say this could be good for you. Too much can make you sleep with whoever's left at 4 o'clock in the morning. Politically incorrect with Bill Maher coming up. 
on a day that's not easily forgotten. News 2 and Storm Tracker 2000 were there for you all day long, warning you, keeping you informed, saving lives. I've never seen better coverage of a severe weather situation. There's no doubt in my mind it saved lives. Experts say it could happen again this season. It already has in Jackson and Clarksville. So wherever and whenever severe weather hits, trust Storm Tracker 2000. Only on News 2. First, fast, accurate. Well, it's a big deal we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, big deal. Uh, 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 big deal. Uh, well, I only make big deals. Big deals, honey. I'm a big man. <laughs> mm -hmm. Honey, I do nothing that's small. Uh-oh. Better get Mako. Car repairs aren't a big deal when you come to Mako. Free body estimates and ambassador paint service for $189.95 are the big reason to say, uh-oh, better get Mako. You're leaking! Now, here's the hit that makes it 42 games in a row for Jolting Joe. We are back again with Phil Rizzuto, Joe Garagiola, and David Halverson. You know, Phil, we were talking about how uh, controlled DiMaggio was, how stoic, and, and, and in some senses I admire that because it shows such great discipline of character. And in, in another sense, I resent it because he really didn't speak very much, and he hasn't left us so many of the thoughts that I think we would have liked to have known about what he went through, what he felt, what he experienced. No, that's true. He never did say much... He'd come in and say hello in the beginning of the season and goodbye at the end of the season a lot of times. He and Dominic, his brother, talked very little. He just wanted to be by himself. He was very happy with himself. And Joe was talking, Gary Giola was talking before about how they had this, every team has a kangaroo court. When you do something wrong, you go in front of the court. And our court was made up of DiMaggio, Henrik, and Keller. But they wouldn't do it in front of all the other ball players. They'd take him in the back room and tell him what he did wrong and why he should never do it again because we'd be in a World Series almost every year and a lot of us got more money in the World Series than we got for the whole season so we were happy that happened kept everybody in tow so hey, Phil I was with Spec Shea this afternoon uh, he said during the ball game he'd come in between innings and uh, Shea was kind of one of those you know uh, kind of funny guys that, Joe you, you should know. tell us who Spec Shea is uh, Spec Shea is a pitcher for the Yankees and uh, uh, what I would like to hear from you Phil is did he do it between innings too Oh, yes. All of the, he kept you on your toes. If, if he saw anything go wrong, and, and one of the beauty things about Joe uh, being such a great ball player and doing things unusual that uh, David said he would come in and take a little smoke or a cup of coffee, but he also took power naps for like 30 seconds. It was people, we would look at him in, in amazement on the bench coming in from the field, and then he'd have that surge of power again. David, you, power you, naps? Power naps. Said? Yeah. Be, between times at bat? Yeah, and when he came, when he wasn't due to hit, or, you know, when the inning was over and he came in, we came in for our three outs. That's, that's a pretty relaxed man. David, you tried to study uh, uh, Joe DiMaggio. Now, I think it's got to be awfully hard to write about a man who says so very little about himself. No, but you can see him through the uh, prism of other people, the players who played with him, the, the passion and the sense, you know, the desire to be the best. There's that great story. Uh, tail end of his career last season, the Yankees ahead by a couple games, his feet are hurting him, and uh, Jimmy Cannon, his pal who's a sports writer, says, you know, Joe, why are you pushing so hard? You know, you've got the several game lead, and he says, because there might be someone out there who's never seen me play before, which is the quintessential DiMaggio story. I think that pride, uh, an awareness of what he meant. You know, today, uh, uh, David, you think about how athletes are dealt with. They have to be in front of the press so much. Joe DiMaggio was given a pass by the press. They well, were, it was, it was a different, um, um, less iconoclastic age. It was a radio age. I think one of the reasons his fame has lasted so much, and he is such an icon, is because he's the last hero of the radio era, a simpler time. I think the Paul Simon song, Where Have You Gone?, Joe DiMaggio is a lament to a simpler time before television, before the society became so uh, powerful and the media got ever more powerful. Radio was a simpler time. Phil, was he a happy man? Who, DiMaggio? Yeah. 
He yeah. was a very happy man. I'm going to tell you something. Uh, the funniest thing I heard him say was, uh, you're talking about the money these guys are making today. Uh, at, at the Dinah Shore Golf Tournament, we're getting our c clubs out of the car, and who drives up with Willie Mays and DiMaggio? And the Yankees had just signed a guy for a gazillion dollars, and I couldn't resist it. I said, hey, Joe, look what the Yankees did today. What would you do? What would you say to Steinbrenner today if you walked into his office to sign a contract? And he put that little smirk on his face and he said, I'd walk in and I'd say, hello, partner. <laughs> How about it, Phil? Did you find him to be a happy man? Was he troubled? Well, he was happy and he was troubled, but he kept it to himself, which was great. He what? never complained about anything. What do, when you think about it, I'm sure today a lot of things came, came bubbling through your mind. What, what image struck your mind the most, Phil? You spent so much time with him. Well, I think that uh, just being able to get away for a while would make him very relaxed. But he was always ready for anything that happened. I mean, he'd, he'd ask me to go to the movie with him. He'd sit in the back row in the very last two seats, and then every once in a while when a light would come on or something, the, the picture would be brighter, somebody would spot him, and we'd have to leave the theater. And never did see the end of a lot of movies going with Joe. <laughs> We got about 20 seconds, David. Leave us with a, with a final thought. How should we look at uh, DiMaggio today? Well, I think it's an extraordinary career. It lasted a long time. One of those players whose, I think, physical grace carried him far beyond the statistics, although there's one amazing statistic, and that is 361 home runs, I think, career home runs, and 369 career strikeouts. That's an amazing ratio, and it shows for it a power is. hitter. The control of bat, the eye, it's just, it just jumps out at you. David Halberson, Phil Rizzuto, and Joe Garagiola. Gentlemen, thank you very much. I'll be back in just a moment.